the Lax Factor Podcast. What is up, lacrosse fans? You're watching episode 229 of the Lax Factor Lacrosse Podcast, and I'm your host, Ted Hoost, and today I'm going to cover a bunch of topics here. We're going to take a break from the top, my preseason top 20, and we're going to jump into talking about Bill Tierney retiring. We're going to talk about U.S. Lacrosse Magazine's preseason All-Americans to try, kind of see where I matched up with them with my own preseason All-American picks. And then we're going to do a little bit of a NLL and PBLA rundown. I'm going to try to use Wednesdays to cover pro lacrosse, even into the college lacrosse season a little bit to try to beef up the content and bring the people what they like because it is very apparent that the PBLA in my little coverage that I've done for it is, do is doing very well, which naturally means the NLL coverage will as well. So I'm going to dive into covering games, which means I just have to watch more lacrosse, and that's great. So as always, be sure to like, subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. Share the crap out of this podcast and video if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever else. Spread the word so by the time we hit the college season, all of your friends are as smart as you because they're watching me, the hardest working man in the podcast game. And as always, you can go to laxfactor.com. We just were undergoing a redesign, so you may run into some weird quirks as you're going through the website for now. But we have t-shirts. We got a new t-shirt here, Lacrosse Dog, uh, printed on either a Gildan or a Unisex T. Um, so go to laxfactor.com. You can support us that way. But let me shut the hell up now here. And we're going to dive into head coach of Denver, former head coach of Princeton, former head coach of RIT. Bill Tierney is set to retire after the 2023 season. A legend in the game here overall. So it's 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 not I, I say it's sad to see him retire, but I mean the guy's been doing this for I think what pushing pushing 40 years, if I'm correct. I know it's over 30 for sure, but I mean it's we're talking pushing 40 years in coaching. And that's just absolutely in, insane or whatnot. And he started at RIT. He actually coached my first college coach, Bill Purcell, uh, when Purcell was at RIT. And, uh, and then he moved on from there, went to Hopkins, moved on from there to Princeton, moved on from Princeton to, uh, to Denver. And, you know, Denver is where he's going to end his career. But let's, let's put this all in context here and let's just kind of rip through what makes Bill Tierney special and why he is the greatest lacrosse coach to ever live at this point. And I don't think it's disputable. Uh, 429 wins to just 147 losses. That's incredible. That's good for a 745 winning percentage. He's won 74.5% of the games he's coached across, I believe that's across all levels. 30 NCAA tournament appearances, 28 in Division I. 25 trips to the NCAA tournament quarterfinals. That may be 23 of those were in Division I. 15 NCAA Division I Championship Weekend appearances, which is bonkers. Nine NCAA Division I title game appearances. Seven national titles. Two-time National Coach of the Year. Won 14 Ivy. I got an Ivy spelt wrong. I'll have to correct that. Ivy League Championships with Princeton. Again, nuts. Three ECAC regular season titles. One ECAC tournament title. Seven Big East regular season titles. Two Big East tournament, uh, tournament titles. Fastest coach in D1 history to reach 400 wins. I think John Donowski is second to him, but, you know, fastest coach to ever do it. Uh, and I think he did it by quite a margin in terms of the speed over Donowski. And one thing I've always said about, about Tierney, he revolutionized how the, uh, the sport of lacrosse was coached and then in turn greatly changed how the sport was played. And uh, we had rule changes recently where we saw finally saw the implementation of a shot clock. After talking about it for nearly a decade, they finally did it. Now, rules like the shot clock that were put in place, they were put in place partly because Tierney is one of the coaches that revolutionized how team defense was played while he was at Princeton. I remember my coach at Cuca, he put a zone defense in for when we played RIT, and it was it was like I'd never seen anything like it. The complexity of the slide package that he un obviously Purcell had learned from uh, uh, playing and then coaching as an assistant under Tierney for a while. Uh, just 
absolutely brought this, the game down to a crawl. He Offensively, his teams, while he was at Princeton, put a premium on possession, taking care of the ball, cutting out mistakes because he was a perfectionist that didn't tolerate mediocrity and stupid mistakes. Therefore, you saw a little bit slower pace of a game kind of happen through Princeton, but more importantly, defensively, you saw it became a lot harder to score when you were playing against Princeton and teams slowly but surely adopted those defensive principles, the slide strategies and packages, and then teams slowly but surely had to kind of start changing the way they played offense in terms of the efficiency of possessions to try to combat these improved team slide packages. Back in the 80s, there were still slide packages, but if, if you got two slides deep, you were doing well back in the old days, and, and th- Tierney's teams could slide three, four, five deep play zones that were all over the place that would just clamp down the field, and therefore teams ended up having to shift the way that they played offense. That created this kind of more specialty type offense, uh, offensive situations where teams didn't used to, oh, you used to have two-way mids. I credit Tierney with kind of the downfall of the two-way mids, partly because of how defense changed in lacrosse and offense had to become a true specialty kind of aspect of the game. So you saw subbing cha- uh, sub changes wholesale now every possession. So those things were all kind of ushered in because of Tierney's co- coaching greatness. Imagine having your hands, hands shape a sport so much that the very rules committees he sometimes sat on had to change said rules to offset the effect that you had on the game. And, and some people would say that slowing down of the game was a negative effect, but that led us to needing the shot clock eventually. So just in terms of the evolution of the game, I do not believe any coach in the history of the sport has 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 affected the game more than tyranny and it would make sense because he's one of the all you know the winningest all-time coach and he's been just doing it forever at a very high level so it makes sense he would shape the game but i think that it will you will never probably see another coach shape the game the way he did you could argue that uh, uh um some of the new younger coaches, you know, the Maryland's and Virginia's of the world, the style of play that they play now, you could argue is, uh, you know, like between Tiffany and Tillman has kind of changed the game. I'd say that, you know, I'm putting a premium for them on recruiting and getting talent there. And that kind of, you know, shapes the way you play a little bit. But either way, Tierney, an absolute legend. I can't express enough how thankful I am to get to grow up watching his teams play. I, I At one point, I hated him. And uh, as I've grown old, I've learned to appreciate the ever-living shit out of him. So I wish uh, Coach Tierney, uh, his family, his lacrosse family, and his real family, I wish them in their one in the same just about, I wish them nothing but uh, the best of luck in whatever's next for him and them. So that was the first thing we had to talk about. Now that we have that out of the way, we can move on to other things. Namely, U.S. Lacrosse Magazine has come out with their 2023 Division I men's preseason All-Americans. And I kind of just want to rattle through the list and just kind of see where there's parallels between what I picked and, and see where there's differences as well between what I picked and they picked. And I'm not going to do this completely because I don't have a real exhaustive list uh, and in one shot of my preseason All-Americans, with Americans, which is stupid. So maybe I'll put that up here later on laxfactor.com. Go there and you'll be able to see it. But here is their list. And right off the bat, the Division One preseason All-Americans first team on attack. I see a guy that I like and I agree with. We have Matt Brandau here on this list. We have a Brennan O'Neill of Duke on this list and Connor Schellenberger of Virginia. I think Brandau is the no-brainer. I think Brandau is probably my fa- my favorite for the Twarton, even though I know he's not going to be, ever, you know, the 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 lacrosse media's favorite for the Twarton because they've pretty much already given it to Sam Handley here from Penn. Even though Brandau's production is insanely is insane compared to Handley. Handley's production is nothing compared to Brandau's in terms of Brandau takes better care of the ball. He puts up a lot more points. His his team has to lean on him a lot more in terms of offensive production. I think Brandau is the clear best player in 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 the Ivy League, and I I feel like I'm the only one. That's saying that. Now, that's not me trying to say like, oh, people are sleeping on Matt Brandau. Nobody is sleeping on Matt Brandau unless you're a moron. But I haven't heard a whole lot of guys talking about Matt Brandau and all the buzz in the Ivy is about Sam Handley. So, and, and rightfully so. Sam Handley is absolutely filthy. But I'm a Brandau guy here in terms of I think he is the best player in the Ivy League. And I do sometimes feel alone, even though I'm sure I'm probably not. Brennan O'Neill, 
I didn't have him on my list. I forget. I think I had Jack Myers as my other as my third attackman. So O'Neill kind of jumps Myers. And I said in my video, O'Neill could potentially was one of the guys that I thought could potentially jump Myers as well as uh, Pat Kavanaugh. I think I thought could maybe jump Myers depending on the season they had. But you know, two of three are the same here. We've got Brandau and uh, Connor Schellenberger that I both had on my list. Now let's get into the midfield. They pick Graham Bundy Jr. That's a no brainer. Filthy midfielder. Matt Campbell of Villanova is also very good. And Sam Handley. I think Sam Handley is probably the best overall. I think Graham Bundy Jr. probably takes a little bit better care of the ball. He's more of a little, you know, I, I called him, I think I called him a jitterbug that's not really a jitterbug is how I kind of painted Graham Bundy. And uh, Campbell from Villanova, just a good all-around midfielder. So I like all three of those picks. Now, short stick D-mid, Peyton Rizanka of Loyola, a very good short stick de uh, defensive midfielder. Face-off Luke Weirman, that matches mine as well. And that that That's deserved. We'll see how that pans out in terms of by the end of the year. Uh, the face-off guys tend to kind of frog jump each other, even though I think the same three kind of typically will hang out between the top, you know, the numbered All-American spots. Weirman is my favorite for sure, and he's obviously theirs as well. But don't be surprised, depending on some uh, the success of some of these other teams, if somebody might jump him, you know, maybe even like a Petey fucking Lasala here. Uh, LSM, Ethan Rawl of Rutgers, well-deserved. Defensively, we've got Gavin Adler of Cornell, uh, who had a huge breakout season last year. Will Bowen of Georgetown, the reigning defensive player of the year. He's also a no-brainer. And Brett Makar of Maryland. I think that mirrors my top three as well. And then the top goalie, uh, Liam Entman of Notre Dame. I don't hate that pick either. I think that's a, a solid pick as well. Now, as we dive into the second team, we've got ourselves a Pat Kavanaugh on attack mixed from Notre Dame, mixed with C.J. Kirst of Cornell and Jack Myers of Ohio State. Now, I didn't do a second team myself, but like I said, I had Jack Myers on my first team, uh, and then I said guys like Kavanaugh, Kirst, and O'Neill might be able to supplant them and then, you know, uh, Myers, I just went with because he's a crafty veteran, and I think Ohio Ohio State and their success may dictate that he ends up popping into that list. Now, midfielders: Shane Knobloch, a big cat midfielder out of Rutgers; Kyle Long, who I thought might end up getting Maryland's number one, did not. So far, Maryland put out their roster, and uh, it, 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 as I'm talking about this, I do not believe anyone has been given the number one, and maybe that means they're going to give it a rest this season. But Kyle Long, midfielder out of Maryland, I think he also could end up having a huge season, partly just because Maryland's going to be forced to rely on him a little bit more than they have in the past. Now, Maryland's brought in a couple of key transfers that I think could take some of the weight off his shoulders, and they're still going to have a very good team. But this is the first year that Maryland is without an apparent offensive leader, and Kyle Long could end up being that guy that could see his stock go up a little bit. And then Jake Stevens of Princeton, filthy midfielder overall, Jake Stevens. Now, he's a guy that if you're not a diehard lacrosse fan that just watches all the college lacrosse you could, Jake Stevens might very well be the guy on the, on this list so far that you haven't heard of. But uh, Princeton has a couple of very good midfielders that uh, are going to be worth watching this year. And Jake Stevens is one of them. Uh, short stick D midfielder, Connor uh, Mayhar, Mayer. I always forget how to pronounce these dudes' names. I think it's Mayhar. Uh, but I might be mixing him up with someone else. Uh, out of North Carolina, face-off, Zach Cole out of St. Joseph's. He's also filthy, just built like a freaking absolute tank. LSM, Tyler Carpenter of Duke, an excellent takeaway guy, can get up and down the field in transition. I love Carpenter's play. I think he broke out two years ago, had a very solid season last year as well. Defensively, we have Owen Grant of Delaware, absolute animal of a defenser, Cole, defense, defenseman, Cole Kastner of Virginia, big rangy guy that can cover a lot of ground and beat on people aggressively. And then last year's break, one of one of last year's breakout defensive star, uh, stars for Maryland, Ajax Zapatello that just took the ball away for Maryland at an extremely high clip. And he's not going to surprise anyone this year. It will be impossible for teams to dodge him. And I expect his, uh, his stats to remain pretty level as well. Second team goaltender, Logan McNaney of Maryland, section four kid out of Corning. Love the guy and uh, well-deserved uh, recognition here for McNaney as a second team All-American. And like I said, depending on team success, that goalie spot as, as much as any of these positions uh, in terms of the numbered All-Americans, any one of these goalies dependent on their team's success could just, you know, if Maryland has a much better year than Notre Dame, 
which I'm not sure that's going to happen this year. We'll talk about that as the season progresses. Then Liam Entman gets it if, if, if Notre Dame does better than Maryland. But if Maryland outplays you know, Notre Dame, then you might see McNaney pop up there. Now let's dive into the third team. On attack, we have Tucker Dordovic of Georgetown. Uh, interesting to still see him playing attack. Georgetown has enough depth that I, I, I thought we might see Dordovic make a move back to midfield where I think that instead of a third-team All-American, he's a first- or second-team All-American potentially. But on attack, he's a third-team All-American. I, I, I probably agree with that overall. Devin McClay and, and, and Dordovic isn't the only filthy transfer that Georgetown got. Georgetown this season, more than any other team, is transfer you. So that's incredible. Uh, Devin McLean of Brown had a great season last year, a great kind of mix between will snipe you off ball but then can carry up from X and hurt you as well. Ross Scott of Rutgers, also a very good attackman. Eric Dobson, a big boy midfielder out of Notre Dame, is on that third team. Sam English of Princeton, he's the other filthy, dirty midfielder that Princeton can uh, stake claim to, Sam English is. And then we've got Patrick uh, Skolniak out of Navy, who I don't know a whole lot about because, you know, I just didn't watch as much uh, uh, Navy lacrosse here last season. Short stick D mid, Piper Bond out of Penn. Face off, Mike Sisselberger out of Lehigh. So notice Petey fucking Lasala is not one of the numbered preseason All Americans. I'm sure he's going to be a honorable mention. And once again, depending on this, I think that Virginia, Virginia is my favorite at this point to win it all. If Virginia wins it all, be sure you're going to see Petey Lasala as either the first or second team All-American if that does happen. But Sisselberger, well-deserved. He's a, another tank of a face-off guy. LSM, Roy Meyer of Boston U, who I'm starting to watch a little bit more tape on as I'm trying to re-watch some full games that were posted on YouTube from last season. He's very good out of Boston U. Defensively, we have Jackson Bonnets of Navy, Kenny Brower of Duke, Chris Fake of Notre Dame. Yeah, Notre Dame... Also, uh, they, they've really bolstered their defense with transfers. Chris Fake, one of those big transfers that they picked up. So that's going to be huge for them. And then Connor Theriault, the people's goalie, out of Brown as the third team All-American. Now we get into the honorable mentions. I want to go to the goalies first here. Um, Matt Garber and Will Mark of Syracuse both got named. And I don't even see the kid that I had on my list here. As the third, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with that, but hey, that's good for Syracuse. Will Mark ended up grabbing one of the honorable mention spots, and Matt Garber of Boston, you grabbed the other. Let's go back to the top here of the honorable mentions now, and I'm just going to rip through them a little bit more quickly. Peyton Cormier of Virginia, uh, you know, finishing attackman that can dodge a little bit as a two dodger, but he's an absolute animal of a finisher and a sniper. Vince Dalt, uh, D'Alto of Boston U, Dylan Gergar of Penn, Leo Johnson of Yale, Owen Murphy of Maryland, Mike Robinson of Delaware, Griffin Schutz of Virginia. J so you got all three of Virginia's starting attack are... Or, or, uh, yeah, all, all three of Virginia's starting attackmen are, are listed on this All-American list here. J.J. Silstrop of Denver. He's got to have a big season for Denver here. Alex Slusher of Princeton, a very good attackman. Dylan Watson of Jacksonville, the Georgetown transfer. I was hoping that for some reason he just went to Syracuse because they had big holes at attack. He ends up going down to Jacksonville, joins another key offensive transfer that's kind of eluding me at the point, but that's going to greatly help Jacksonville keep pace with the season they had last year because they get almost everybody back offensively, and you get to add a 50-plus goal scorer like Dylan Watson to the mix. Aiden Blake. Of Cornell, midfielder, Jeff Connor, midfielder out of Virginia, Hugh Kelleher, the big boy midfielder out of Cornell that I am a big fan of, Thomas McConvey, transferred from Vermont to Virginia, another big boy lefty midfielder that I like, Dylan McDermott, uh, or Declan McDermott of Georgetown, Brad Sharp of Yale, Brian Tevlin, of Ye formerly of Yale, transferred to Notre Dame, another key transfer that Notre Dame added to shore up their roster. As we get into the short stick D mids, honorable mention again, Chet Comey. Uh, Comizio from Villanova, Bo Peterson, Princeton, Gray, uh, Grayson Soliday of Virginia, very good short stick D-mid, Chris Yeager out of Harvard, and Trevor Yeboa Cody out of Brown, who's also very good, someone that I've, I've noticed over the course of the last few weeks as I've been, like I said, watching game tape from last season. 
Honorable mention face-off guys, James Riley of Georgetown and Petey fucking Lasala of Virginia. We get into the LSM honorable mentions, Pace Billings of Princeton, Greg Campisi of Harvard, BJ Farrar of Penn, John Gepper of Maryland, and Alex Mazzone of Hopkins. If we get into the D, I'm going to kind of rip through these. Jack D. Bennett, uh, Jack D. I, I used to know how to say this name, but I'm, I'm ill prepped here. Jack D. Benedetto. I screwed that up. Marcus Hudgens of Ohio State. I've heard rumors, though, that Hudgens, they're not sure of his status in terms of when he can start playing. I want Maybe that's been handled here, but, I mean, he, he, he could greatly bolster that Ohio State defense if he ends up being eligible and can play. Brendan Lavelle of Penn, Cade Sawstead of Virginia, Bobby Van Buren of Ohio State, Cam Wires, Loyola, Matt Garber, Boston U, and uh, Will Mark. Uh, of Syracuse with the two goalies, Garber and Mark. So that is your honorable mention All-American list. I hope that wasn't too boring hearing me rattle it off, but if you didn't see it already, that's what we are rocking. Now, let us ditch this, and I want to talk quickly about – I'm going to frog jump the NLL, and I'm going to talk quick about the PBLA because one thing I want to talk about here is the PBLA's Skylar Thomas. He plays for the Syracuse Spark. I watched the the very first game of the season, the All-Americans against the Spark. Noticed him in that game, and uh, he scored a couple of nice goals. But then I went to the Elmira game and watched him play in that Elmira game. Now, I don't know what his by the end of the game stats were. I do know he was a problem offensively in terms of getting a bunch of shots off, feeding a bunch of dudes that helped them get a bunch of shots off, and he also scored a really, really nice dive goal from behind, kind of a dive backhand goal. I'll I'll roll the highlights for that as well. But that's a player I wanted to highlight here. I don't know much about him other than it looks like he played at Onondaga at least that 2018 season. The Lasers won a national title that year. It, it, the stats that I found, whether they're accurate or not, say he scored 29 goals and had 40 helpers that year for Onondaga. Uh, so far in the two games that I've watched him play in the PBLA, the kid is a problem, kind of a breakout star. And and part of that breakout star aspect is everybody that that's watched the first two games got to see him play. One of the games of the week was the All-Americans against the Spark, where the Spark lost. And then the, the game I went to was also the game of the week, uh, the Renegades against the Spark. Spark lost, but he played well in both of those games. Seems to be a true 50-50 threat throw some nice passes, can score goals, can score highlight real goals. Syracuse often gives him their penalty shots, which means of all the finishers on that team, he's one of the best. And uh, he seems to be a bright spot for the now 0-2 Syracuse. Now, I have on Lax Factor, if you go to laxfactor.com forward slash PBLA, it's right now it says up here PBLA coverage. Just go to laxfactor.com forward slash PBLA and it'll take you to this page. Um, so far, I this podcast will end up showing up here. I've only done two so far where I've talked about it. But as we look at the standings here, the Jim Thorpe All Americans are sitting at two and zero. Oh. The Binghamton Bombers one and zero. The uh, uh, what is it? The New England Chowderheads one and zero. Oh. Uh, the Hammerheads are one and one. The Elmira Renegades one and one. The Trenton Terror one and one. The Mayhem are one and zero. Oh. I should have them up higher on this list. The Bootleggers zero oh and one, and the Spark are zero oh and two. If we look at the scores from last weekend, I believe these were uh, the Mayhem and the Hammerheads. The Hammerheads beat the Mayhem eighteen to twelve. The All Americans beat the Bootleggers fifteen to ten. And the Elmira Renegades beat the Syracuse Spark 16-11 last week, and that was a game I went at. Only game that I have notes for. I want to I wanna start giving the scores and having some game notes for all of these. But once again, I, I do not have access to the PBLA statistics. Even the PBLA individual team social media accounts aren't putting out anything like you'd think after a game. They'd say, hey, we won. Here's the guys who scored for us. Yay for them. I don't even see that for the most part, but I'm going to try to go through maybe some local news networks to see what they've said. But in terms of the Spark and the Renegades game that I attended, Elmira jumped out to an early 6-0 lead before allowing the Spark their first goal. I thought it was over the way that the Spark were playing or the Renegades were playing. 6 nothing, and the Spark had done nothing up to that point, and the Spark ended up tying things back up, I think, by the half, like 9-9 to or 8-8 to at the half before the Renegades then came out, kind of scored some goals, and uh, pulled away for the win. Owen Hill finished the game with five goals, I believe, and I believe four of them were off penalty shots. Owen Hill has been the Renegades' kind of penalty shot taker, and it has paid off huge for him so far. And then Skylar Thomas, like I said, scored that highlight, highlight real goal from behind the net, burying it past Elmira goalie on the short side. And then likewise, uh, Bubba, um, 
uh, uh, I'm losing Bradley Voigt's name out of my in my data bank for a moment. Bubba Voigt ended up scoring two goals in that game and stuck one between the legs. So, people, the PBLA, the quality is high. The name recognition is going to be more. Anyone who loves field lacrosse, you're going to recognize a lot more guys' names in this league than you would maybe even in the NLL, depending on which team you're looking at. Uh, it, it, you know, The focus is kind of on American field players playing box. That's not always the case here because you have a lot – of uh, native-born players that have been playing box their whole life, and you can see the rosters are just filled with the Hills, with Thompsons. You know, I haven't seen any Bucktooths running around yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if we did at some point if if we have any of them still running around. So you you see a lot of native-born um, players just you know wrecking this league so far. I want to say the first game scored all overall in the league was scored by a Hill. I don't know which Hill it was. And then Bing the Binghamton Bombers first goal was also scored by a Hill. So that's interesting as well. Elmira also has a Hill. Um, so they're everywhere. The Hills are, and they're very good at playing lacrosse overall. So I, I, I will bring you more complete coverage of the uh, PBLA once they start getting some statistics out so that we can kind of rip through games here overall. And uh, you'll be able to just go to laxfactor.com forward slash PBLA uh, to you know, kind of get that. I'll have all the podcasts that I talk about the PBLA posted here. We'll keep the standings running here, and then I'll end up having uh, scores, game notes for every game, other highlights, shorts, all that crap. And if you want to see shorts, I'm posting multiple shorts through the rest of this week of the Binghamton and the Renegades game. Uh, I'll have another two shorts posted today, tomorrow, and the next day. I have them all saved, all ready to go. So if you're into shorts, check us out on TikTok and on Instagram, and we're putting all of the shorts there. I'm not really putting the shorts on YouTube because I don't want to screw up my flow. Only a few shorts here and there for YouTube. All right, So there, and there's a look at Skylar Thomas. The dude can play lacrosse. Now let's get into the NLL. Had a big weekend of games here in the NLL as well. Calgary Roughnecks lost to the Colorado Mammoth. And let's see here. Tanner Cook had two goals. Connor Robinson, five goals for Colorado. Jesse King for Calgary, three assists. Reese Duck, Duke, I don't even know how to pronounce his name here, uh, four assists for Colorado. Jesse King, five points. And Connor Robinson, six points here. Dylan Ward made a huge save in this game down the stretch. There was actually maybe two saves over the last minute as uh, Calgary tried to you know score the game-tying goal late and that did not work out and uh, Colorado was able to pull out the win in that one and uh, one thing that was key here too I when I was kind of flipping through and watching the highlights here uh, oh nope that's not this game that's a different game so let's move on from this one second game I want to talk about I watched this one a little bit more closely and paid attention a little bit more was the San Diego Seals against the Vancouver Warriors and in this one at about the time I turned it on uh, it was a tie game right about Oh, yeah, tie game four up here when Austin Stotts scored his first goal of the game, I believe it was. Yep, he scored his first goal of the game to give San Diego the lead, and then later on in the third quarter, he scored back-to-back -back goals uh, on assists from Berg, Dixon, and then from Berg to give them that 8-5 lead, and then they kind of rolled from there, and the Seals took off and won this game. Overall, here, point leader, Wesley Berg. He ends up with eight points on the day off seven assists and one goal. So that's a pretty filthy day for him. Dane Dobby had a hell of a day, too. Four goals and uh, off 12 shots here is what it's saying. I still wish we would be able to see the uh, more complete list of the scores. I don't like this whole game leaders where it doesn't give you that guy's full stats. Um, that's why still to this day... I do not know why the pro leagues in lacrosse haven't adopted this, but nobody does statistics better than sidearm sports. All of these college teams that play at the Division I through the D3 level that use sidearm sports, they have superior reporting in terms of statistics and all that crap to, to what these leagues have. No question at all here. But in the end, ended up being a good game. You can't, you know, for instance, you can't sort these and all that crap. What did uh, our boy... Um, Mac O'Keefe had three helpers, man. That, that's what you got to love about box lacrosse. Trailer, yeah, Dane Dobby, four and three. Curtis Dixon, three and two. Austin Stotts was four and three on the day. Kind of my Austin Stotts watch because I've been watching him closely here. As we rip through other games, I'm just going to give you scores real quick. Uh, Philadelphia Wings beat the Las Vegas Desert Dogs 14 to nine. And we have Rob Hellier, five points. For Las Vegas and uh, Joe Resiteris, nine points in the win for Philadelphia. 
we have Panther City losing to the Rochester Nighthawks by a score of 17 to 9. Leaders on that, Holden Katoni. That's, I love that name, Holden Katoni. Uh, nine points. And Jonathan Donville for Panther City ends up with six points on the day. Who won the goalie battle? Ryan Hartley of Rochester wins the goalie battle with 41 saves. They end up winning the game. Halifax Thunderbirds beat the Albany Firewolves 14 to 11. Randy Stotts ends up with 10 points for Halifax. Connor Kelly leads um, the uh, uh, Albany with, uh, what was it, six points. Goalie battle. Man, Albany's goalie, Justin Getty, had to put up 52 saves on the day. Warren Hill with 41 saves. Warren Hill ends up getting the victory, though, for Halifax. So, hell of a game there, too. Buffalo Bandits beat up on the Georgia Swarm 18-9. to Dehogan Nanakoke with eight points for Buffalo. Andrew Q with six points for Georgia. Goalie battle win goes to Matt Vink, who picks up 30 saves on the day and gets the W as well. Jordan McIntosh, two uh, cost turnovers there. Yeah, Day Hogan finished the day with four four goals, four helpers. Josh Byrne ends up with three and four for Buffalo. You know, not bad. Brandon Robinson goes five and one for Buffalo. I think that's for Buffalo, yeah. So, hell of a job. Let's see what the Swarm did. Lyle Thompson goes the GOAT, three goals, two helpers for Georgia, and then Andrew Q, three and three, like I said. Only two real real bright spots there. Ryan Lanchberry, though, field, field across guy sighting. Ryan Lanchberry, he goes for one goal and two helpers in that in that game there. We'll kill that. And then the Toronto Rock 15-7 to win over the New York Riptide. Tom Schreiber for Toronto ends up with seven points. Lars Sundown, there's a Sundown playing in the PBLA as well, I think for Syracuse. He goes for three points, and uh, Nick Rose gets the win in cage with 34 saves on the day for Toronto. Standings overall. Here for the in the NLL, we have the Rochester Night, Nighthawks, the only undefeated team, sitting here at four and zero. Oh, Buffalo Bandits and the Halifax Thunderbirds are both three and one. Philadelphia Wings right behind them at two and one. Toronto Rock two and two. Albany Firewolves Firewolves are one and two. And the Georgia Swarm and New York Riptide are both winless, sitting at zero oh and three. And then we kind of go into the stat leaders. Point leader here, Randy Stotts, 32 points. Dude's absolutely tearing it up. Dane Smith with 30 points right behind him. Dane Dobby, 28 points. Curtis Dixon, 28 points. Wesley Berg, 28 points. You know, so that's a hell of a job there. Dane Smith with 26 assists right now as the leader. Curtis Dixon, of all people, leading the league right now with 16 goals. And I thought it was funny. Penalty minute winner. Uh, well, the winner is Jake Withers here, but second in penalty minutes, Dehoga Nanakoke, man. Keep that up, Dehoga. Shots on goal, Tommy Schreiber's winning that battle here. Loose balls, Jake Withers, no surprise, 69. Loose balls, TD Erlin, no surprise, 60 himself. Zach Courier, though, here with 58. So hell of a job for all those guys, and we are out of there, and we are out of time. That is today's podcast. Like I said, Wednesday show, I'm going to try to make it more of just to cover as much news as I can and make sure I do a, some sort of rundown for both the NLL and the PBLA, right in, even doing that into the college season. I'll kind of mix the, the college previews with a rundown at the end of every episode for the NLL and PBLA as they start playing into the college season as well so that is it guys thank you for watching thank you for listening be sure to like subscribe share the crap out of the podcast with everybody and as always you can go to laxfactor.com as we're doing our redesign and you can get yourself some swag t-shirts i'm going to try to put up a new t-shirt every couple of weeks the new t-shirt this week is the lacrosse dog t-shirt i might as well show it to you there we go custom designed by me Boom. That's our lacrosse dog t-shirt. So you can help support us by just buying dope t-shirts and generally, but all I really ask, like subscribe and share the crap out of this podcast with everybody. So we get more people uh, on board. We already are doing excellent. Like I said, I'm the hardest working motherfucker in the lacrosse podcasting game, and I will keep doing that. I'm really the only guy I think podcasting right now. So that's it. I'm out of here. I'll be back Friday for another Lax Factor Lacrosse film review. I don't even know what I'm going to cover yet, but I will have a film review out on Friday. And then be sure to come back Sunday morning for the uh, continuation of all of the uh, of my top 20 preseason poll. Now that I have a media vote, I'm going to have to do that every week. So I'm kind of putting that together with my logic and everything like that now. So be sure to come back for that as well. As always, go to laxfactor.com to support us. Watch the videos there. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And Hoost is out. 
the Lapse Factor Podcast.